I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will cover each and every piece of lore on Jango Fett in canon. There's a lot of stuff that is mutually exclusive in Legends, so the complete Legends story will be a separate video. There's going to be a lot more detail, and so it will be quite a bit longer. So be sure to subscribe if you want to catch that when it comes out. In this canon story, you will see that Jango Fett is a man shrouded in mystery, with a very complex psychological profile, and is a man who would leave one of the greatest legacies in galactic history, and in more ways than one. His date of birth is still unknown, but based on his appearance we can assume that it was around the year 60 BBY, making him about 40 years old during the opening of the Clone Wars. Jango would claim to have been born on Concord Dawn, which was within Mandalorian space, and is in almost all ways considered to be culturally Mandalorian no different from being born on Mandalore itself. Proof that these were seen as full Mando worlds is evidenced with places like Kalvala, which was the homeworld of Satine, who would come to be the leader of the Mandalorians. So if he was born on Concord Dawn and adopted the Mando culture, he should be considered Mandalorian. But everyone doubted this story, and even Fett was known to enjoy the uncertainties surrounding his background. His Mandalorian armor would be a definitive sign to most, but there is this statement by Prime Minister Olmec. Jango Fett was a common bounty hunter. How he acquired that armor is beyond me. Now his motives for saying this can be questioned. After all, it is convenient to be a member of the new pacifist government, and then just decide who is and isn't truly Mando. But the biggest giveaway is that the armor is made from Durasteel, not Beskar. All Mandalorian suits of armor were made with Beskar, and were made that way for millennia. Beskar was only found in Mandalorian space, and the metal became something of a proof of the covenant with the ancient Mando war god. The metal took on spiritual significance, seen to be showing that this was the promised land for these warrior people. So a Mandalorian suit of armor made of common durasteel would be seen as sacrilegious, both a spiritual and cultural insult. And this isn't some ancient belief. It is still strong decades after Jango's death, seen with the Mandalorian clans after the fall of the Empire. And during Palpatine's reign, the Duchess was a prototype weapon that would target the Beskar alloy in order to kill off the rebellious Mandos while not interacting with anything in the Stormtrooper armor. It only worked because actual Mandalorian armor is always made with Beskar. So all of this evidence points to Jango Fett merely adopting a Mandalorian persona to help launch his bounty hunter career. Because he was in this blue and silver suit from the earliest days, long before he was able to claim the title as the deadliest bounty hunter in the galaxy. Though it may not have been made with the holy lightsaber-resistant material, we do see the heart of Beskar right in the middle, that beloved Mandalorian symbol that has worked into designs all across Mandalore, representing their perseverance through their ancient war with the Jedi and Republic. And though the source of his animosity towards the Jedi is unclear if he wasn't a Mandalorian, he definitely hated the Jedi like a true Mando. In addition to the armor, he would have these pouches that contain extra blaster packs, trackers, and explosives while the gauntlets would contain vibroblades, a dart shooter, flamethrower, and whipcord launcher, though these could all be swapped out to meet the specific demands of the mission. If you look close, you can see that the knee plate has these pair of small rockets, and the helmet provided a wide array of information, using data from the sensors inside of this helmet itself, as well as the viewfinder, which allowed for some pretty neat tricks, like being able to see behind him. As for blasters, Django preferred a pair of Westar 34s, these were powerful pistols that could rip through most armor, and were made out of a special DeLorean alloy that allowed these to be fired at such a quick rate and intensity that would melt down almost any other blaster on the market. Django's would be further modified to fit his gunslinger life, hollowing out much of the handle, trying to remove as much weight as possible to allow for a draw that was just a few nanoseconds quicker. And then there was the iconic jetpack and rocket launcher combo. With these tools and his incredible athletic ability and powerful mindset, Jango Fett would grow to become infamous throughout every star system. Take a second to think about how much he understood and appreciated the compound effect of all these choices over a lifetime. Gaining an edge as a young man by attaching himself to the Mandalorian's millennia of military tradition and their long relationship with the bounty hunting profession. Choosing a faction that was known for their laconic speech, meaning a young Django would always be expected to play it cool and never explain too much about himself. And it provided a nice way to hide your face, particularly useful when you're younger, and when older and more experienced hunters might be able to look you in the face and see the uncertainty, stare you in your eyes and sense your fear. And then even down to making the pistols just a couple ounces lighter, all those decisions show you that this is a man who is constantly thinking ahead 
and finding any way to give him even the slightest advantage. The details of his rise are still shrouded in mystery, but by around 32 BBY, Django would have a meeting with a mysterious client on one of the moons of Bogdan. The Sith Lord Darth Tyrannus made a proposal that no other hunter could have ever dreamed of. 20 million credits, and he didn't even have to personally kill anyone. Quite the opposite, in fact. This professional killer would give life to millions, and a job that would end with the death of thousands of Jedi. The Sith had decided that of all the various species to choose from, the clone army would be human. And if you needed a crafty, human warrior template, Jango Fett was the obvious choice. Dooku could sense that this was a man who was incredibly concerned with his reputation and legacy, saying that the credits should be more than enough for him to retire if he wishes, but most important of all would be his lasting effect on the galaxy. Jango Fett would be a name that would be in every history hollow from here on out. But this bounty hunter was a great negotiator as well. While he was being promised what some would see as cultural immortality, he also wanted to gain the sort of immortality those feel in seeing themselves live on through their progeny. The clone troopers would all be genetically manipulated, but the Kaminoans agreed that the very first clone produced would be unaltered and given to Jango as a son. Again, we see an interesting quirk of this man, forgoing any relationships with a human or even Twi'lek or Zabrak female. We can speculate why this is, but what matters is that he loved his son Boba. Part of the contract with the Kaminoans was to set up a residence on their watery world, and be directly involved in training the clones in everything from mindset to tactics. He proved to be such a good leader that not a single clone in the program was performing below the parameters. Though this took up a majority of his time, he had no love for these men who shared his face and DNA. Once remarking, quote, What do I have to be proud of? Livestock bred as cannon fodder? And Django was not willing to leave the bounty hunting life behind. When he wasn't training the livestock, he was training his beloved son. Django would be contracted to help return a Twilight girl who had run away from her parents, leaving with her failing lover named Griff. Django would be working alongside a team of three other hunters, which even they thought was overkill, and noted that it was downright insulting to a man like Fett. We also see that rumors of his big payday with some elusive client had spread throughout the community of deadly professionals, noting that they don't even know why he would need this job. This odd crew included a Gand, a Rodian, and a Chadger fan, and they were all quick to their feet to introduce themselves to this legend, but are startled by a young boy who steps out to say hello. When Django states simply that his son Boba will be accompanying them, they have no choice but to accept. Moments later, we see father and son flying through the city in the Slave One. This ship was made by Kuat Systems Engineering, and is of the Fire Spray 31 class patrol and attack craft. It was loved by security firms, and was designed and commissioned for guards to patrol the enormous prison moon of Uvo 4. The exact details of how he got this are unknown, but legends say that this was during his escape from this prison facility. As they leave the inner rim world of Telerath, we see the young Boba Fett is frustrated by this mission working with a bunch of no-name losers when he knows his dad was friends with infamous hunters like Cad Bane, Aura Singh, and Zam Wessel. But this was exactly the point. This whole mission was chosen by Django to make sure his son didn't become spoiled, made soft by his father's success. He wants to show him what it's like to work with these less professional hunters, and on such a mundane mission. When Boba says why can't his dad just choose the bounties he wants, he says, quote, I can now, but it took me a long time to get here. On Ord Mantel, they spot their target, and wait for her lover boy to show up. When they are in each other's arms, the crew springs to their feet. Blasters and vibro knives raised. The failing boyfriend makes a run for it, abandoning the girl and driving her into a panic. She scrambles up on top of the railing, and with the young Boba watching, she falls off the ledge. All think they just watched this girl plummet to her death, but that Mandalorian jetpack saved the day. Django swoops up to intercept, and before she can finish her thanks, the professional has her stunned, temporarily paralyzing her for easier transport. And his son was there, grinning at the sight of his father in action, Django showing how he thought of all the potential ways a job could go south, and teaching Boba to always trust his instincts, even imparting a wise bit of psychology, saying that desperate people make stupid decisions. As if on cue, the Chadra fan makes one of the dumbest decisions anyone in the galaxy could make. Knocking the boy to the ground and stripping him of his blaster, and then putting two blades up to the neck of Django's son. The Rodian knows that this seeming Mandalorian thoroughly earned his notorious reputation, but the Gan raises a blaster and tells him to help, or else. That if they could kick out the high-ticket Django, their cut of the bounty would be a whole lot better. 
When the captor asks if Fett was going to save his son, he gives the cold and confusing reply, no, and turns his back to walk away from the pinned boba. This thoroughly shocks the vile little creature, though he wouldn't have much time to contemplate this, as a blaster bolt fired at close range would rip through his body. The boy pushing his captor aside and saying that he had a lesson to teach as well, to always search your prisoners. As the Gan raises his blaster, we see the amazing sharpshooting skills of Boba, and he tells us that his father always says that a clean kill is best, but target practice keeps you sharp. Django stoically staring on from down the alleyway. The Rodian is horrified and tries to make nice with the galaxy's top hunter, but Boba is still deciding if the green man shall live. Ultimately, Django shows great parenting skills by giving the boy some decision-making power. And to the Rodian's relief, the boy tells him that he is free to go, after forfeiting his share of the bounty, of course. Despite this amazing ability by the young boy, Django makes sure that his son understands that this only happened because of his own negligence. But if Boba could control himself, then he ultimately had control over every situation. As they soar off in the Slave One, Django admits that he didn't know what Boba would decide with the Rodian. He listens to his son repeat the logic, but senses that there was something more. Pressing Boba, his son admits that he did it so that the Rodian would run off and spread the story, adding to the legend of Django Fett. But the father points out that this was the start of the legend of Boba Fett as well, saying, quote, You shot well, you trusted your judgment, and you've started building your reputation. A father couldn't ask for a better start to his son's legacy. It wouldn't be long after this that Fett was contracted with a much more important job. The task of killing Naboo Senator Padme Amidala would be one of the highest profile hits of his career. For the last 10 years now, forces connected to high-ranking members of the Trade Federation had been plotting to kill Padme. And as one of the most vocal opponents to the idea of the Republic forming an army, Lord Sidious decided that it was time for her to finally go. Or at least that she should have more serious threats to her life. Maybe in order to push Anakin into a role that would compromise his connection with the Jedi. Whichever was the true outcome Sidious aimed for, sufficient credits were delivered to Jango's account. And he went to work developing a plan, which would involve subcontracting some of the tasks to a changeling bounty hunter named Zam Wessel. Explosives were placed in Padme's J-type diplomatic barge, and as the Queen arrived on Coruscant and walked down the ramp, Zam hit the detonator and the whole platform erupted in flames. But the Queen was crafty as well. A decade of failed assassinations had her and her security team always thinking ahead. Padme was in a Naboo fighter, while her handmaiden and body double Corday was the one killed. Later that night, in the upper levels of Coruscant, we see a clandestine meeting between the Claudite and the human bounty hunter. Zam has to report the news of her failure, but Django presents a unique solution. My client is getting impatient. Take these. Be careful, they're very poisonous. Zam, there can be no mistakes this time. A droid would cut a precise hole into the window of Padme's bedroom. Pushing these venom-filled Calhouns through, they would quickly pick up on the scent of a target, scurrying up to the senator, only to be cut down just seconds before they could feast. And we see why Django decided to subcontract this role. Knowing how skilled the Senate security, the Naboo security, and the Jedi were at tracking down targets. After a long chase through the upper levels of Coruscant, the Jedi would capture Zam, but before she can give up the name of her employer, Django makes sure the trail goes cold. A dart would be fired from several hundred meters away, hitting his friend and fellow hunter right in the neck, the poison rushing into her body and taking her life in just a few seconds. As the Jedi look up, all they can see is the distant figure of an armored assassin fleeing via jetpack. Perhaps Django believed that this dart was so odd that it could never be tracked, leaving no clues to be gathered at all about who he was or even the device used. But he underestimated the tenacity of Kenobi, and it wouldn't be the last time. Django was right that even the greatest database in the galaxy, located in the Jedi Temple archives, could not identify where this dart came from. The only place the Jedi could think to turn was to an old friend, who had worked in some of the strangest and far-off places in the galaxy, and even outside of the galaxy. Coruscant's upper levels were blessed with one of the best eateries under any sun, Dex's Cafe. The Besilisk proprietor and head chef would take a look at this odd device, and actually recognize something about its markings. What you got here is a Camino Saber Dart. Again, we can see why Django went with this option, as even with the name and location of the planet Camino, Kenobi could still not find it in any of the Jedi's databases. This wasn't possible, as the area was fully mapped, 
But with a little guidance from Yoda and some youngling wisdom, Obi-Wan would make his way to the spot where Kamino should be. And despite the Archive's claims otherwise, there was the water world that was home to the mysterious cloners. Before the Jedi would meet Jango, he would lay eyes on thousands of his genetic copies, as Lama Su and Tan Wee gave the Jedi a tour of their cloning facilities. Proud of this immense army of the Republic that they had raised, and the Kaminoans are eager to answer Kenobi's questions about the process. We modified their genetic structure to make them less independent than the original host. And who was the original host? A bounty hunter called Jango Fett. As they walk on, the cloners provide more info about some of the quirks of Jango's personality. Fett demanded only one thing, an unaltered clone for himself. Curious, isn't it? So you can see that even the cloners thought that this request was strange, and actually divulged this info without Kenobi even asking about Fett's compensation. But now Obi-Wan knows that this bounty hunter may contain the answers to his rapidly increasing list of questions. Down one of the many sterile white halls of Taipoca City, they would be brought to Jango's rather spartan living quarters, and the Prime Minister makes an introduction, where we see that Jango wasn't concerned with teaching Boba in the arts of manners giving an annoyed look at Kenobi before letting them in. And as the Force would have it, the most skilled bounty hunter in the galaxy made a simple mistake that would eventually cost him his life. Leaving the door open to a room that contained his iconic armor, Kenobi could sense the hatred this man felt towards the Jedi, and after a compliment about the clones, Jango provides a short and vague answer. I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe. Without missing a beat, the Jedi probes him about his recent travels, and Boba can tell that this seemingly pleasant conversation is growing more and more tense. When Obi-Wan mentions the name of the Jedi who supposedly placed the original order for the clones, Jango knows he should be worried. In a language that the father and son created, called Fet Code, he gives a simple command to close the door. Then you must know Master Cypher Dias. Oh, Boba, Rudet Sohik. Jango seems a mix of confused and confrontational. Never heard of him. And we know that he is telling the truth with this next sentence. I was recruited by a man called Tyrannus on one of the moons of Bogdan. But Kenobi isn't buying it. He knows that this man is being as unhelpful as possible. There's nothing more to gain here. And as he leaves, the Jedi expresses his interest in the army. And Jango sends one more infuriatingly disingenuous parting shot. Always a pleasure to meet a Jedi. And as Kenobi left, Jango thinks about how serious the situation is. Pack your things. We're leaving. After a meeting with the High Council, Kenobi goes to confront Jango. We catch his loading up the last of his belongings into the Slave One. There was no doubting it now. This was the blue and silver set of Mandalorian armor that was spotted on Coruscant. Mama, get on board! As soon as the Jedi's blue blade is activated, the Westar 34s are drawn, and those powerful blasters start laying down fire. Kenobi closes, but the jetpack gives Jango the high ground, an advantage that almost took the Jedi's life. Boba sprang into action as well, rotating the Slave One and drawing the cannons down. This distracts Kenobi, giving Jango the opportunity to rain down a missile that erupts just in front of his target. Boba would open fire with those laser cannons, creating another explosion that sends the Jedi flying away. But when Jango comes down to finish the kill, Kenobi knows that giving up the high ground was a mistake, landing a powerful kick against the faux Mando armor. This sends the blaster flying away, but even on his knees, Jango is a better martial artist than most warriors in the galaxy, intercepting the next kick and flipping the Jedi onto his back. The next seconds would see them trading blows back and forth, the armor providing an advantage, but the force allowed the Jedi to bring back his blade. In this battle between mystical powers and high technology, Fett would use the jetpack, rangefinder, and whipcord launcher in perfect synchrony, tying up his target with only a split second to spare, and then dragging the Jedi across the landing pad, only to be stopped by a quick-thinking Kenobi. The cord would whip the bounty hunter down, damaging the jetpack, but Jango was able to get back to his blaster and fire a shot, only to have it narrowly miss and result in a kick that would send them both careening down the side of the dome structure. Those blades in the gauntlet would save Jango from falling, and with a press of a button, the cord was released, sending the Jedi plummeting hundreds of feet, presumably to his death. Jango would walk back to the ship, and his son would lift off from the platform. The bounty hunter might have made a clean escape if it wasn't for a palm-sized tracking device that Kenobi was able to land on the Slave One. Jango was headed for Geonosis to rendezvous with the man that forever changed his life, Lord Tyrannus. Only a few seconds after they emerged in Geonosian space, Boba sees something alarming on the scanners. Hang on, son, we'll move into the asteroid field. And we'll have a couple of surprises for you. 
<laughs> Much like his mindset and his armor and gear, his ship was also prepared for everything. The seismic charge was one of the most deadly and unique ordinances in the galaxy, creating a tremendous shockwave and plane of blue plasma energy that ripped through the asteroids. A brilliant move by Django, to turn the already dangerous asteroids into thousands of rocky shrapnel grenades that would blast out millions of rocks that would be able to rip through the smaller Jedi fighter. When he sees this didn't work, the rapid-fire laser cannons mercilessly bombard Kenobi. An unrelenting flurry of bolts that pushed both Kenobi's piloting abilities and connection to the Force. One of these blasts connects with the Delta-7. We got him! We'll just have to finish him. Again, Kenobi's ability to stay calm and focused on a solution saves his life, only getting away by releasing a cloud of spare parts. And the resulting explosion, along with Obi-Wan cutting off a lot of his electronics, helped to avoid the Slave One scanners. Well, we won't be seeing him again. Django and Son would make it down to the surface and enter one of the Geonosian hangars. Later that night, Tyrannus would discover that his old friend Kenobi was still alive, and regretfully had to sentence him to death, along with the recently captured Anakin and Padme. A circuitous but acceptable route that would finally lead to the death of the Senator. And Django made sure that he was there to watch in person, acting as bodyguard and honored guest of the Dark Lord. When the Republic scum were proving too much for the beasts, Newt Gunray, a man who had paid for multiple previous attempts on Padme's life, starts to get a little worried. Django! Finish her off! When the droids are released, it seems like the crowd would finally see blood. Eyes were transfixed on the arena, while Mace Windu made his approach, responding to an earlier signal sent out by Obi-Wan. The Jedi many considered to be the greatest warrior in the Order made his introduction. This party's over. Young Boba looked up and was squirming helplessly at the sight of a purple blade hovering near his father's throat. Ever the stoic, Django just calmly stands there and waits for an opening, while hundreds of Jedi activated their lightsabers across the Colosseum, sending the bugs into a panic. But once the super battle droids emerged, they demanded Windu's attention, giving Django the chance to unleash the flamethrower, setting the Jedi's robes ablaze, and forcing him down into the pit, which was being rapidly consumed with blaster fire. When the Verk Jedi Coleman Trebor drops down on Dooku, the Count doesn't even blink, knowing that Fett's quick draw was one of the most reliable things in the galaxy. The Westar 34 bolts at this range are so powerful that they snap the lightsaber back, shifting Trebor off balance, opening up for a blast to his side, sending the Jedi falling over the edge. A death Jango celebrates with an impressive gun spin. And we see that although he repaired or replaced his jetpack, he did not replace the blaster lost on Kamino. Driven by bloodlust and seeing the Reek would prove an ally against Mace, Django ignites his jetpack and flies into the fray. Mace would lop off a horn, but loses his lightsaber. Instead of firing first, Django can't resist the chance to pick up the blade that has just landed at his feet. But again, the Force proves a difficult thing to counter. Windu ripping the blade back towards him, activating the weapon as the Reek trampled the nearest threat. The feet damaging his jetpack, removing the advantage of this portable high ground machine. But as the beast turned and prepared for another charge, Django made the weapons designers over at Westar proud, dropping the monster with a single bolt through the skull. An incredible amount of stopping power for this small pistol. Now he would have to finish the Jedi Master. Turning with his blaster raised, he opens fire. <laughs> If you look close, you can see that Django was not simply standing there, only hoping to overwhelm Mace with the power of his blaster. It's actually the same tactic he used against Obi-Wan on Kamino. Let the Jedi approach and then soar above them with the jetpack. But he did not realize that this jetpack system had been completely destroyed. You can see at the very last second of his life that he activated the jets, but there is only this short sputter of flame and short circuiting, while the Jedi carries through his strikes without any hesitation severing the blaster, and then Django's head. Dooku would look on in shock, while the young Boba was looking on devastated. His awe-inspiring father, respected by all bounty hunters in the galaxy, and feared by everyone else, always the smartest and strongest man in the room, was cut down so quickly by this Jedi. Moments later, when the battle had spilled out into the rest of Geonosis, Django would make his way down into the Petronaki arena, staring into the helmet of the man who meant everything to him his only family and only friend in the galaxy, killed by a Jedi. Though the boy was lost and unsure of what to do next, 
he had one burning certainty, to get revenge. A year later, he would work with one of his father's allies, Aura Singh, to try and kill Mace Windu by bringing down an entire Venator-class Star Destroyer. When he learned that his target had survived, and knowing that these Jedi would go to search for survivors, Boba shows that he was willing to give up his most sentimental possession to get that revenge. Using the most recognizable symbol of his father, the blue and silver Mandalorian-styled helmet as the bomb itself. Later during this plot, Boba would be captured by Plo Koon, but was unwilling to give up the location of hostages that were set to be killed. And we see the boy was driven mad by the abrupt loss of his father, and his family now being the vicious hunters like Bosk and Singh. Why should I help anybody? I've got no one. But the Pirate King Hondo Onaka is able to talk some sense into the boy, reminding him of what his late father stood for in life. It is the honorable thing to do. It's what your father would have wanted. Though Boba Fett would carry on in the bounty hunting profession, eventually even recapturing his father's title as the most notorious bounty hunter in the galaxy, there was still a code of honor that he followed. And in a way, his father would get his own revenge against the Jedi Order in 19 BBY, as it would be the eyes of Jango Fett that locked with thousands of Jedi across the galaxy in their final moments, seeing their panic, confusion, and pain as blaster bolts riddled their bodies, bringing a decade-long plan into reality, and firmly securing Jango Fett's legacy as the most influential bounty hunter in galactic history, and for that matter, one of the most important beings to have ever lived. So that's it for the complete canon life story of Jango Fett. If you want to see the Legends version, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it, and if you like this video, please leave a like and a comment, as those things really do help with the YouTube algorithm. And be sure to check out the description, where you can pick up this cool Star Wars art, and even free audiobooks from Audible. There you can also find ways to support this channel for free, or check out our Patreon and PayPal. For just $1, your name could be here. And special shout out to our $25 supporters, Chris Garcia, Serif Diaz, Cass Costello, and Carlos Velez. But most important of all, remember, in the deadly world of bounty hunting, sometimes you gotta fake it till you make it. And the Force will be with you. Always.